hey everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender. I am Z Garcia. Today we are going to be talking about back to school games. So games that either feature a school theme or they're good for the little ones as they're heading back to school, maybe something you can get them and have them start the school year off just right. You know, a little something. Before we get to that, however, I do have a couple of things I want to mention. I have a contest winner to announce and before I mention who Who's the winner? I do want to say thanks to everybody who participated. I had uh, a ton of entries and I'm, I'm really thrilled to have all the viewers write in and, and uh, some of you said a little nice uh, something or other. It was excellent to see all the participation, so a big thank you for that. Before I say who the winner is, however, I do want to mention AnalogGamer.com is going to be having a, a, an awesome sale on these uh, snazzy shirts right here. Friend of the Blend shirt. So if you want to let everybody know that you are a friend of the Blend, head on over to AnalogGamer.com and pick yourself up one of these. It's a limited time sale, so uh, make sure you take advantage of that. All right. And now for our winner, the winner of the Blender 1000 contest, winner of 50 Cool Stuff Ink bucks, and entered into the $1,000 contest is... Sarah Keeling! Congratulations, Sarah Keeling. Uh, again, I'll be uh, uh, contacting you to let you know all the details. You'll be uh, finding out later on about the, the big draw that Tom Vassell will be doing. So stay tuned for that. And again, thanks everybody for participating. So, let's kick off our Back to School episode now. Hey guys, Tiff here, and it's back to school time, so today we're talking about educational games. Of course, this is right in my wheelhouse, but maybe not exactly in the way most people think. When I started my middle school board game club, it was for educational purposes, not so much to provide my students with factual knowledge, but to enhance their social skills. I wanted them to interact with their peers without screens between them. I want them to learn how to be wrong, how to adapt, and how to have fun for fun's sake. All the things that I've learned from board games. The cool thing is you can develop these skills with almost any board game even if that game is just a simple Box of Rocks. Box of Rocks is a humorous trivia game for 2 to 38 players that plays in less than 15 minutes. It fits firmly in the filler category, but is surprisingly addictive and fun. As the human players, you're trying to win a best of three trivia contest against two quote, synthetic but astoundingly astute rocks, and ultimately avoid embarrassing yourself. As you might expect, this highly portable game includes the rocks, with both blank and numbered sides, along with a scoreboard, tracking tokens, and a set of 100 trivia cards. Each card has three questions, all answerable numerically with a 0, 1, or 2. On your turn, you read a question and give your answer. You can answer individually or cooperatively as a group. Finally, you shake up the box of rocks, check their answer, and see who got it right. The first entity to get three questions right wins the game. When I found Box of Rocks at Gen Con, I completely overlooked it, because it's just a silly party game. I usually avoid these for board game clubs since party games are pretty mainstream, and I like to introduce my students to hobby games they might not otherwise discover. I'm glad I took another look, because I've already gotten well over my $10 worth of entertainment out of this game. Box of Rocks is a perfect trivia game for middle schoolers, because playing against inanimate objects is so goofy, you can't possibly take it too seriously. Although you definitely learn an interesting fact or two while playing this game, it probably doesn't have the serious academic value that an educational game should have. Those games are out there and can be invaluable learning tools for any classroom. But since our board game club is extracurricular, we have slightly different objectives. One of those is learning how to use your free time to have fun and relax with your friends without checking your phone every two minutes. Box of Rocks is good enough for that, or to use in between games of Freedom the Underground Railroad and Compounded. Check it out, and I'll see you back next time. Good morning, class. Good, good morning, morning, Mrs. Thomason. I think today we are going to work on our geography. So let's see here, Miss Caitlin. Where is the longest and largest fjord system in the world located? 
Greenland, ma'am. Very good. You may be seated. Miss Nessa, the Pantanal Swamp, the largest swamp area in the world, where is it located? Brazil. Excellent job. You may be seated. And Hunter, where is the Eiffel Tower located? Texas. Texas? Yeah, Paris, Texas. No, it's Paris, France. You may be seated, Hunter. Caitlin, will you do the honors, please? Thank you. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Somebody needs to work on his geography. Any suggestions how he might improve? Miss Caitlin. He could play Tara. That is an excellent choice. So today we're going to look at Tara. It plays two to six players, lasts about 45 minutes, and it's not your typical trivia game. It is geography based, but you have this beautiful board with a map and you're going to not only guess about the location, but some other things like what year something was founded or lengths and distances and things of that nature. Yeah, it's one of those trivia games where you don't necessarily have to know the right answer. It's great if you do, but if you're sure of someone in your group that knows the answer, you also get points to, for putting cubes adjacent to the correct answer, which I really enjoy. And there's kind of a little jockey in on who, uh, who can get those adjacent pieces if you're sure that someone knows the answer or if you know the answer. Um, so it's a great game. Like she said, um, you're, you're doing uh, several things. You're going to... Do, you're going to be using the board, you're going to be placing a, a cube on the area you think the thing is. And then there's two other things you're going to be answering. It could be a year, it could be a length or a distance between things, or it could be some number, like a number of uh, certain good produced in a country or things like that. Population. So, so it's, it's kind of, a, not only is it a geography lesson, it's more of a kind of a, what is it, social studies? You're learning about <laughs> th different things in uh, various countries. So. That's kind of Terra, and we really enjoyed this game. It even plays great. I think it plays great two-player. Yes, it does play great two-player. Now, you can potentially have a good runaway lead if somebody goes off of a hunch and you don't follow up with that. So it's really fun. There's a lot of um, opportunity for banter back and forth. Yeah, and along the same lines of Terra, this is uh, from Bezier Games. A eh? Friedman Freeze has a series of games like this, so I want to give you a quick look at those before we finish up. Um, there's also Fauna, which we actually did in an earlier blender, and this one's more about animals. Yes, and their stats and where they live. Yep, and then the brand new game. This one, I don't know how learning this is, because it's more pop culture, but the brand new game along the same lines is America. Mm -hmm. And it's got, it's mostly uh, pop culture, but it does have a little bit of geography, geography and it has a little bit of, like I said, that kind of social studies learning about various states and things. Yeah, it's a mixed them. bag of a little bit of everything. It's very fun too. Yep. So, so I highly recommend all, we love all these games. Yeah, absolutely. And so check out Terra. Again, it does play really great. Two players, two six players. Blast for everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey everyone, it's Maggie Bot for Board Game Blender, and today we want to talk about educational games. Uh, I am of the belief that all games are educational in some way. Everything teaches you something valuable in the way that you interact with other humans, and the way that you win or lose, or all kinds of things. But I think the point of this one is to literally see some value between a game and how it's going to help you in school. Now, I saw a lot of the other um, contributors were like talking about paperback and letter tycoon and things that are like really, really scholastic. So I figure I'll say my piece here and then I'll give a couple of board games uh, example of what I consider to be super educational. But the first and foremost thing you can do to teach someone some sort of math is to teach them card games. Poker, spades, cribbage, blackjack. All of these have really, really strong links to, directly to probability, sums, 
tactical math, changing values, uh, every time you take a card out of the environment, having to redo that math and count the cards and know what's available, um, just down all the way to cribbage where no matter how many cards are on a table, I can tell you how many times you can count to 15 in them. And that's all really good, cool ways of mapping your brain and making that type of math available to you all the time. Now, because we're the Dice Tower and we love board games so much, now what can you do in board games that would give you that same sort of benefit? I believe strongly that especially in bidding games and knowing the value of things in games, if I can take a look at the game I'm playing and know exactly how many victory points an action is worth, then I can evaluate the rest of my actions based on that knowledge, whether or not they're valuable. I find that bidding games like Raw, like uh, Nautilus Industries, like any kind of stock market bidding, auctioning, anything like that is super, super valuable in teaching you skills that will help you do well in other games and hopefully in school, because you're all in school, I'm sure. Um, in my line of work, you see a lot of educational games, and they mean like literally it might help you learn your elements or some history, but I think that. There are lots of values in all games that you play that are directly responsible for making you good at decisions and thinking and critical thinking and all of those things are super, super valuable. That's all for me for now, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye. Okay, son, back to school. You want to be happy, right? Let me give you some life goals to pursue. You want happiness, strive to be great. You are social, build on the child trait. Study group, eat a salad, be engaged, write a ballad, buy a toolbox, learn some fancy, start a book club, ballroom dancing, do Sudoku, learn to cook, start collecting, write a book, business school, 10K run. Daddy, I just want some fun. I know what he needs. Kids are all the same, life is very hard This is not a game, think about your career No time for balloon, you're gonna need a job And get married soon, eat more salad Start in sales, watch your play, feed the whales More collecting, be promoted, get enlightened This is Sonia, I'm going crazy here There's so much you can do Gibt es keinen Deutschkurs, das wäre was für dich I know what he needs People are all the same Life is very hard This is not a game You think this is a joke What about your career? You still don't have a wife And the end is getting near Make a board game Serve a dish Tend the garden Catch a fish Visit Holland Make that hole Buy a house This is Nicole Last collection Just retired Go on cruises And admire One last salad Try a new job Grow a tree Have you met Bob? today is going to be uh, back to school. So I had an opportunity to actually talk to my brother uh, who is actually a teacher and I asked him just a few questions and what kind of games that he actually recommend to his students. So let's go ahead and view that video. All right, so I'm here with my brother Mark. He happens to be a teacher at, well, where do you teach? Uh, Desert Springs Middle School. Right, so um, he happens to be a gamer, but he actually is, is like, this is your first year of doing teaching. Yes, it is. So going into that, um, I guess my question is to you, uh, what are the games uh, would you teach? So I, I actually challenged him to actually give three games to see uh, if it's like, to recommend to students. So um, one of the first ones I like to recommend is definitely a game called Zeus on the Loose. It's a card game, um, has a lot of um, 
arithmetic um, capabilities on it. Um, you're constantly um, adding and subtracting. You're doing some rounding also. So definitely that will kind of build skills with that. Yeah. So, so that's it, one of them, yeah. definitely. Yeah, so anyways, just, uh, you know, just to summarize it, it's just a card game when you put uh, a number on and you're trying to do is uh, get the number all the way up to uh, 100, right? Yes. And then you, if you win, you spell Zeus, but there's ways to do it. So if you go over 100, whoever has Zeus, and it's pass basically passing Zeus um, left to right and see who actually has so there's a bunch of there's a bunch of god cards that have different effects yeah. and it has number cards which is the basic stuff yeah. and also Zeus and Luz, um it's very competitive also because you want to get Zeus eventually and then spell out his name so you know especially middle kids who like to be very uh, competitive with each other that's definitely a game I recommend all right so what's the uh, the second one uh, this one is more for my um, English language learners so because every class has English language language learners of course so um, code names is definitely a really good one to have it get to teach them a little bit more mm -hmm. vocabulary yeah and um, very very excellent game actually yes. and I think you even have I have a copy right here, so. copy right over here yeah. So. yeah so code names everyone actually should just actually just have this anyway yeah definitely <laughs> um, what's really good is um, the idea of connecting words with other words so when um, you know when students are actually working and they get to work with code names, they can connect words from previous vocabulary, especially those you know who are foreign. They can't um, let me say they can't know a lot of the words yet, but it kind of builds a vocabulary from that. So they could use you know um, words in Spanish, I guess, for a lot of my English language learners. But mm -hmm. in, are, are, are most of your students like English language learners? Uh, yeah, definitely. I'd say about thirty to forty percent of my students are. Yeah, it, it's a middle so, school, right? Yes. Yeah. So you know that, that kind of age, and I think it's a good um, game to actually play that age. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, we got the last one, and this one's probably the one most mathy of all of them. Um, a really mathy one I would recommend also is Catan. Uh, Catan is definitely, you know, it's one of the more popular games, first off. It's a good way to expose the board gaming world with a lot of middle schoolers. And it has that competitive aspect to it because it's not really so much on the math side, it's more on the logic side, which is, does it make sense to take, you know, two sheep against one brick or something like that. So students kind of have to think what's their best method of, you know, attack for this. And it's more of... Um, more of problem solving than anything else. How do I solve this problem of not having enough of some resource where I could trade with this and take advantage of the game basically or you know with points wise and how, how do we get the most points with the amount of resources do I have? So definitely yeah, there, yeah, another, yeah, another great game too and you know, all that strategy and stuff and, then, mm -hmm. and one game that I actually you do actually like a lot is actually Can't Stop. Oh yes, Can't, Can't Stop. stop. <laughs> That's a really good pro probability game. It has a lot of um, dealing with dice and what's really nice is the board if you just look at the board itself it has probability on it so you could see like for example 2 and 12 you know there's not that much um, it's hard to get yet there's only three spaces or two spaces I can't remember what's on there because it's been a while since I played um, but if you look at the other sections like 7 for example it's the longest stretch because it comes up more often yet 2 and 12 don't come up as often so definitely yeah. a good game to expose to kids who want to kind of learn about probability and, um, in, in that sense. And then you can teach them a little bit about statistics and kind of guide them through mm -hmm. that. But yeah, that's what it's, it's, good it's a good start. It's actually a good game to go before, you know, playing craps. No, yeah. <laughs> you don't so, want to play craps. So no, no, no. That's, that's actually, not a good way to yeah. do it. Anyway, yeah, I, actually, I, have, I don't even have even played Can't Stop yet. I haven't even played it yet, so I, I do want to, I know that, like the concept is, I've seen yeah. people playing it, but I actually have yeah, not played it before. It's a great four player game, um, you just keep on rolling basically, it's the roll and you decide if you want to stop or not, does it, do I take that risk of keep on going or do I be safe and stop there and then move my, you know, my marker up, so. All right. So anyway, that's all the time we have today, and I want to say good luck to my brother. He has right. already started school already. Right? Yeah, this, this is his first year actually teaching, right? Yes, yeah. it is. And it's been about two and a half weeks so far, so a little rough on the edges because, you know, it's just jumping into a pool of cold water, and hopefully things will go well in right. the next uh, year. So. Okay, great. All right, anyway, that's all the time we have today, and remember to keep on stacking the eggs.
For today's quirky game, I'm taking a look at Letter Tycoon. Letter Tycoon here is a word game, but it's also a money management and sort of investment game. In it, you are going to have cards that you are utilizing to build words, all right? This is very much like a Scrabble type uh, idea here. You'll have some cards in your hand, you are going to be playing them, you are going to be building words, and then you are going to be making money on those words. So depending on the letters you've used, you'll be making some cash. And the coins in this game are really great. Nice wooden coins. There's even some here that are a three denomination and black. These are just beautiful coins. And besides all that, that would be a pretty decent game up to that point. But this game has something else and where the tycoon part of the game comes in. And that is uh, the idea that in the game you can buy cards that are letters. You can buy the letters themselves. And so you could own the S, for example, or you could own uh, the W, which is cheaper because it's more rare. It'll show up less. And when you own one of these, anybody else who uses that, well, now they have to pay you because it's your letter. You own it. And so that's the concept of the game. It's Knowing which cards to play to make the most money, knowing how to utilize your hand to its maximum effect, but then also knowing which of these to buy, you know, knowing which letters you, you'd like to purchase, and some of them have special powers on them, so they might be more rare, but they'll give you a little boost like the X here. Uh, it's only worth two dollars, but, and, and it's very rare, right, you, you're not going to get a lot of words that have the X in them, but it does say you may use one letter card twice, and so you're buying a little bonus as well when it comes to that. You're going to have a stock here, uh, so you have tiles that have stocks on them. You have a little guide as well that lets you know the breakdown of the letters. And that's basically it. It's a fairly simple concept. You know, Scrabble meets stock manipulation, kind of. But the way it comes together keeps that clarity and I like that. It's not a convoluted game. It's one that I think is going to go over well with a uh, young adult. It's going to go over, over well with, uh, you know, grandma or grandpa playing with the kids, playing with mom or dad. So it can accommodate a nice group of folks playing together and it breaches all sorts of um, uh, age ranges and things like that. So I definitely would recommend you check this one out. You're looking for a good word game with a little something more to it then Letter Tycoon might be the one. Look into it. Hello there, folks. Uh, it's Blender again. It's us again. And uh, today we are uh, showing you Paperback. It's designed by Tim Fowers and illustrated by Ryan Goldsberry. Yeah. So what's the theme of this wonderful game? In this game, you are a novelist and you try mm. to complete different paperbacks, like the cheapish novels, to get the most fame. Mm. I think the cheapish is a uh, really good word to it's, use in this game, no? That oh, is yeah. the new word. All right. Paperback combines deck building, similar to, for example, Dominion, really simple one, and Scrabble, which are, I, I call them two mechanics. Yeah, but Scrabble isn't mechanic? Really, isn't really mechanic. Yeah. But still, it combines the two of them. It's it doesn't, it's not innovative. Yeah. Some sort of mechanics are not innovative, but the feel is innovative. Yeah, the feel is really fresh. You really feel that you're playing something you have never played before. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna play uh, the letters that you have in your hands yeah. to form words, and it's a deck builder. So that's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. 
As I already told you, Paperback combines Scrabble and deck building and combines it in the easiest way. Where you have a deck builder of a level of Dominion. You just have a hand of five cards at the beginning of your turn and then you're playing these cards down. But the cards are letters and you're forming different words. And you score these words. And by scoring it means you will get the currency uh, with, uh, which you, you know, with what you can buy new letters or fame cards, which are basically points at the end of the game. Yeah, so fame cards are lovely paperbacks, the covers, so these are kind of actual books you've written. Yeah, and what is um, cool again is that the gameplay has different modules as well, where you can uh, play it cooperatively, where you put fame cards into the pyramid and you try to go through the pyramid mm -hmm. and try to get all these fame cards, or you have the theme uh, cards, you have special power cards, so each player will have his own special power and some other things there, so... Yeah, lots of modules to yeah. mix and match and make the game either more yeah. hard, the easier, more aggressive, yeah, or more less aggressive. Inter interactive, like... I, mm -hmm. I really like that you can build the yeah. actual game you like. And I really like the, the small cabinet where you can take the attack cards out. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. make it less aggressive and more mm -hmm. solitaire multiplayer, so... These are... Basically the whole, like, you know, rules of this lovely game. Paperback is an excellent teaching tool. I would say as good as Scrabble because it makes you learn words. And here we put ourselves on the same level as kids because we don't know so many words. At least we kind of realize with this game that we know so few words and it makes us research. And the words we find, we actually remember them better. So, yeah. Yeah, and on the other hand, it's a really cool teaching tool for a mechanic called deck building. Yes. <laughs> Because it's it's the simplest way of deck building here. Yeah. With a little bit of special True. powers. So True. it's True. two teaching okay. tools. Two in it's one. really good as a gateway deck builder yeah. and scrabble and teaching new words. And overall really good uh, game for non gamers even. Yeah. Like it's it's mind blown. It's perfect. It's, it's um I don't know all these English words, so yeah. let's just... We let's just, just recommend yeah. this right. game. Yeah. Go check it out. Yeah. Paperwork. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Time. Is it the real word? Time. All right. Bye-bye. We'll figure out. So this week I want to talk about a designer who I feel is one of the most historical designers in U.S. history. His name is Jason Matthews. He, um, if you didn't know, he used to work for one of the senators and he used to work in Washington, D.C. So when he came up with his game Twilight Struggle, a lot of that is because he had all this historical background and he obviously was very involved in politics. That is his most famous game, Twilight Struggle, but he also has a lot of other games that he did in the same similar mechanics. He, he did 1960, The Making of a President, which is the competition between Kennedy and Nixon in their presidential election. He also did 2008 Campaign Manager, which is a smaller scale version of 1960, where it's Obama and McCain, and they're just fighting for the swing states, not the whole country. And he has a new game coming out from Stronghold that I would highly recommend as well um, about the Reformation. So if you're looking for Reformation era in the same kind of style of game, then I think that's a very good one. But if you're looking in general for a designer who does a lot of historical games, a lot of card-driven games, a lot of flavor and learning, you can learn about history very much with his designs, whether it be the election ones in the U.S. or Twilight Struggle, which goes through the whole cold war era of the united states and the ussr it gives you a good background of history and you will learn a lot from playing these games hi 
Hi, welcome to Boards and Crafts, a place for quick tutorials with snacks and crafts inspired from games, for games, and all about board games. School is back in session, so this is the perfect excuse to talk about games that we think are educational, and one personally that I think is that way is Compounded, a board game that is all about creating all of these compounds created from the non-metal elements that we see around us every day. And so in honor of that, I thought that it'd be great to create one of the compounds that you see in the board game as a chemical keychain. Let's get started. The supplies that you'll need for this project include a pair of scissors, a keychain clasp, some red glass beads to represent the oxygen, some blue glass beads to represent your nitrogen, and some long thin glass beads to represent the bonds between these elements. You will also need clear monocord wiring to tie it all together. To start this project, you will need to measure a portion of the cord to cut. The length is up to you, but I would guess that about six inches is more than enough to make the compound I chose. I just cut a random amount and cut all the excess off later, so like I said, it's all up to you. Next, you will need to string the red bead onto the cord. Loop the string around that bead and stick the two sides of the cord through the long clear bead. Add a blue bead, another clear long bead, and one last blue bead to the string. Tie a knot at the end to make sure that it all is secure, then tie a couple of knots around the clasps to connect it all. Stick the excess wire through the closest bead if possible and cut the excess off. And that's it! If you guys have any ideas for tasty treats or creative crafts inspired by any of the board games mentioned in this video, comment below or tweet them at me at artsyrobot. Thank you guys for watching and I hope that this day has been filled with fun facts. Welcome back to Game Olympics, everybody! Today we are awarding bronze, silver, and gold medals to some game category. And what's today's category? Theme integration that won't teach you anything. So, let's kick it off. Our bronze medal goes to a game about wealth distribution and money management, and it is called Cash and Guns. You should probably not engage in this sort of activity when you are simply trying to figure out who pays the bills this month. Bronze medal. Our silver medal goes to a traveling game, and here's what it teaches us. Takeda tells us that you should talk to every stranger you meet. You can expect to pay sometimes three times as much for the same exact quality of food as the person right before you. And every time you arrive at a farm on your travels, you should take all their money. And finally, the gold medal goes to Istanbul that has this to teach us about bartering, trading, and selling. First of all, make sure you make frequent stops for gambling. Secondly, if you see any other shoppers, if at all possible, send them to the police station. And finally, make sure you carry all of your gems in a big wheelbarrow. And those are the winners of our Game Olympics. Three games that if you're teaching the little ones, you might want to put a different spin on them. See ya. Hi, welcome to the Bargain Bin. Benny here, and alongside me, as always, is Kirsten. Hey. And today we're going to talk an educational game. Uh, the one we have is called Timeline. We picked this up on a whim. Um, the local game store we go to, uh, whenever we try to use their library, we always try to get a free game, which probably explains... Oh, <laughs> we don't get them for free. <laughs> but <laughs> we do not take games for free. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do do is we buy a small game, which explains why we have all these barking games. Um, but the one we have today is Timeline, and I'll go ahead and let Kirsten tell you a little bit about it. Well, the specific version that we have of Timeline is the American History version, but there are a lot of other different versions as well. Some of those are inventions, science and discoveries, music and cinema, as well as some others. These timeline games are educational card games that are published by Asmodee. They play two to eight players, and you can find most of these right around the $10 range. So each card in this game shows a different event, and in this specific version that we have, it's an American history event. So some examples are the foundation of Harvard University, or um, Benjamin Franklin's kite experience. And each side has a side that does not show a date and then also a side that does show a date. 
So to start the game, you are going to deal out four cards to each player and you're gonna deal them date side down so that you cannot see the date. Then you're gonna take a card from the deck and put it in the middle of the table date side up. So this one, for instance, is the Purchase of Alaska and it happened in 1867. Then each player is going to take a look at their hand and they are going to try and find a card that they think they could correctly place in the timeline. For instance, I'm gonna say that I think the foundation of Harvard University happened before the purchase of Alaska. So I would lay it here date side down and then after I laid it down, I would turn it over to see if I was right or not. So the, purchase, or the foundation of Harvard University did happen in 1636, so I was correct and I would leave my card there and it would be the next player's turn. However, if I was wrong and I put this after the purchase of Alaska and turned out being wrong, then I would discard my card and have to draw a new card. And then the goal of the game is to get down to zero cards, so whoever gets all of their cards correctly in the timeline first will win the game. So what do you think of it? Um, so we had to think about a educational game to feature and we don't have many of them. Um, I thought of this one because I thought back when, you know, when, we were, when I was in school, all the like activities and games that I really enjoyed doing and the ones I really enjoyed were the ones where I didn't realize that I was learning. Like it wasn't obvious that the activity or game was designed to facilitate facts to you. And I think timeline fits that bill. Um, I kind of wish I was still in school because I think you could really use this in a classroom setting really well. Like if you split the classroom up between, um, you know, like two teams and I, there's enough variety here. I mean, you can kind of see like this is a pretty uh, fat stack of cards. They're pretty small. But I think like you could take a chapter of what you were teaching and pick the cards out and then have the, te uh, the classes and teams compete to see who could put the right cards in. And I think it would invoke discussion in the classroom as they argued to where they thought what, uh, you know, where each card went. So I think it would have been a, lo a lot of fun to have gotten to play this in the classroom setting in school. But it's not limited to that either. Um, I think we've also enjoyed it in kind of a social setting where you're just kind of sitting back trying to enjoy some good conversation. Um, the stuff here is interesting and it, it kind of invokes conversation as you debate and argue about maybe where something goes and you can just kind of sit around and relax and you're not too focused on like the actual mechanics of the game. So I think it has a, a really uh, broad depth of uses and kind of, you know, it works well with a lot of different people. I think it's one um, we'll take to our family next time we go over there. So that's a timeline. We have the American history version here. Um, it's a, a really fun game that also has that educational element where I think as you continue to play it, some of these dates will stick and you'll be smarter for it. So thank you for tuning in and we can't wait to see you next time. Folks, welcome to Corner Chat. Uh, Mark, this week we have another fantastic designer with us, Mike Selinker. Welcome to the show, Mike. So this week's theme has to do with games that have some sort of educational value, and one of our family favorites is Unspeakable Words. So how did this word slash spelling game evolve, and with such a fantastic twist using the Cthulhu theme? Uh, Unspeakable Words, yeah, it's one of my favorite games. Uh, so I came up with this game in a kind of a weird way. My friend Monty Cook, he's a game designer, he's, we're doing a game together called The Ninth World, a skill building game for Numenera. I think people will like it. But anyway, back to this game. So he had a convention at his place called MontyCon, and uh, we played the original Arkham Horror there. But I died on turn two. I went walking in the dreamlands with a Thakwa. So I was looking for another game to play. So we played Scrabble. But it wasn't your normal Scrabble. It had like six boards and people hopping from board to board. It was nuts. So then I went to sleep. 
and I woke up with unspeakable words fully formed in my head. It was crazy. Uh, I scrambled for a piece of paper. I managed to write it all down. Uh, and it's basically pretty much the game you see today. With uh, So anyway, uh, people might say, hey, that Mike Selinker, he can design games in his sleep. Well, kind of did. <laughs> that is awesome. So the artwork is very whimsical, especially considering the theme. Can you talk a bit about the art and those awesome ponds? Yeah, the art's great. I really like it. Um, it's always been a whimsical game. There's not enough uh, Call of Cthulhu style games that are funny. And so this one's pretty fun. Um, Tony Steele did a great job. John Kowalik did a great job on the uh, deluxe edition. Uh, it's 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 about the right end. Boy, those ponds. Man, Playroom really made some really great-looking ponds. Everybody wants those. So, uh, yeah, I just love it. It's the right look for the right game. You know, one of my favorite aspects is the point scoring on the cards. It's really clever using the angles. Yeah, I really like the mechanic there. It's... Um, I love the fact that the angles are part of the game because the uh, Hounds of Tindalos come through the corners of the walls, and the more angles you have, the more dangerous your room is, so the more dangerous the letter is. And so it's always been kind of a great thing that the game doesn't care about how frequent the letter appears in the English language. Instead, it just cares about how scary looking it is. And so, yeah, I just love it. I think it's great. I also really like the number system and the mechanics for going insane. Yeah, the number system's great. I mean, it's uh, 100 points. Um, you're going to see somebody get to 100 points, and you're going to see everybody else crash out along the way. I mean, it's super fun. And so, yeah, it's it's always cool to be the winner when everybody else is insane, but it's also cool to like run toward victory at the end. It's pretty fun. I think the whole game really holds together. Together, and I, that's why I really love it. You know, I can't agree more. It's still one of our favorites. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. This has been great. Thanks for letting me talk about unspeakable words. Hope you'll see it soon. Yep, you bet. So great to finally have you on the show. And folks, thanks for joining us as well. So until next time, we'll see you at the table. And that wraps up our episode, everybody. A big thanks for tuning in. A big thank you as well to all my contributors, of course. And don't forget, if you yourself are interested in being a part of our little board game blender family, then you can uh, send me an email, send me a demo, and we can talk about it. You might be featured on the very next episode, all right? And that's it. As always, come on back in a couple of weeks for our next episode. And hey, do not forget, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.